and welcome to another edition of Proselytize or Apostatize. I'm your host, David Russell, along with uh, no co-host today. Um, I'm joined here by Jason Jewell and Caleb Jackson, who is, you know, not, not a uh, stranger to the show, but uh, Jason is, and uh, I will let him uh, come on here and introduce himself. Uh, we're going to have a debate today called, Is There Sufficient Evidence for God? So Jason, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself real quick? Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, my name is Jason Jewell, and um, I've uh, I've been an illusionist for the past twenty years, a lecturer, talker, speaker for maybe past seven to nine years, and um, I like to discuss skepticism and things of that nature. I like to discuss philosophy, logic, uh, syllogistic structure, and um, theism is a really interesting topic. I, I used to be a theist myself. Um, I'm from Michigan. I moved to Florida, which is where I'm at now. Um, and yeah, not too much. I have two children. I've been married for 13 years. Um, my youngest child is the closest thing to a proof of a possible God that I know of because he is a demon from hell, um, to be sure. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Awesome. Caleb, uh, why don't you, uh, introduce yourself again, just for the people that don't know you. Yeah, thank you, David. So I'm Caleb Jackson, uh, I'm an author, currently a university student studying political science and communications. Um, I've published a book on the resurrection. I'm about to publish my second book on um, theodicy and the problem of evil, which will probably be done um, late January, early February, goes according to plan. But of course, you know, 2020 and 2021 are unpredictable, so who knows? But uh, we'll have to see how that goes. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, guys, this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. It's actually uh, um, something that I love to discuss. So this is all type, you know, this is exactly why PRA was made was to discuss these type of things. Now, the format is what we're going to be uh, getting into right now. So it's going to be 15 minute opening speeches each. Um, obviously, we'll start with the affirmation side, which is Caleb's side. Uh, so, yeah, Jason, you'll have the last word tonight. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> ten minute rebuttals each, uh, forty five minute cross examination, and we're gonna play that one by ear. The guys have worked out maybe they'll spend a certain amount of time here, a certain amount of time uh, with the with the next guy, but we might just end up doing an informal dialogue like we normally do. Uh, five minute uh, closing statements, and after that we'll close out the show, gentlemen. So with that, Caleb, why don't you uh, get us started here? All right. Is he going to let me share my screen? Because I have a. I don't think so. Google you're going to have to. I don't oh. think you're going to be able to share your screen on this. I mean, you could try. I can try. Yeah. Give it a try. Can you see anything? I can't see nothing. Okay. Well, let me just hit stop sharing then. So you, you didn't see your own screen or anything? Um, try it again. I. Uh... Okay. Oh, hold on. Let me try this instead. Is that any better? Um, you see any yeah, of this? Seen your content. Oh, here we you go. You can see that. I, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. I can okay. see it on, on here, but it's not going to be on the OBS, I don't think. But you can go through it with uh, Jason. Oh, it isn't. Yeah. Well, I can just yeah, just for visual aid. You know, can't hurt. All right. Just All right. Perfect. So the case I will be presenting today will be arguing that there are good reasons to warrant belief in a god. I will not be arguing that those who disbelieve in God are irrational, but merely that one can be rational while affirming belief in God. The arguments I will be presenting are as follows. One, God is the best explanation for contingent things. Two, God is the best explanation for objective morality and value. Three, God is the best explanation for miracles, specifically the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Four, belief in God is properly basic and warranted through personal experience. Let's look at that first argument, that God is the best explanation for contingent things. Now, when I say a contingent thing, I mean something that requires something else in order to explain its existence. For example, my existence is contingent on my parents, and this computer's existence is contingent on a factory or a technician. It is possible that all of these things could have not existed. So why then does anything exist at all if it could have failed to exist? The obvious answer is that some things can't not exist. They exist not contingently, but necessarily. The existence of one or more necessary things explains the existence of contingent things. So it can be said that at least one thing must exist necessarily. 
but why can't we just say that the universe exists necessarily? I think there are a few reasons why this is unlikely. Reason one, a necessary thing has to be timeless and changeless. If something can change over time, then it is contingent on prior states. The universe is a series of ever-evolving physical states, all of which are contingent on additional physical states. Point two, Occam's razor holds that the simplest explanation is the most preferable one. The simplest explanation would likely be a perfect being. Why? Because a perfect being does not have what's called arbitrary limits. If, for example, we say that atoms or quarks or energy exist necessarily, we would have to say that all independent attributes of matter exist necessarily. All of the countless laws of physics and limits of matter exist necessarily, making the explanation more complicated. In contrast, a perfect being that has no parts and no limits is a simpler explanation. It is one thing that exists necessarily instead of thousands of different things that exist necessarily. Therefore, a necessary, changeless, timeless, perfect and limitless cause for contingent things is the best explanation, and this we call God. Secondly, I will argue that God is the best explanation for objective morality. Naturalistic morality seems to fail on four primary points. One, natural selection. Uh, in natural selection, fitness is described as the ability to reproduce. It is not equated with the well-being of others. In fact, often countries with the highest population growth rates have very bad standards of living. Point two, Naturalism cannot account for objective value, for human beings are no more objectively important than any other collection of matter. At most, we can appeal to emotivism and say that we want to survive and want to have value, but this does not make it true. If our desires alone can justify a belief independent of reality, then one may have no problem with belief in God or religion. Point three, materialistic naturalism cannot accurately account for free will, because the physical laws that make up our minds are inherently deterministic. Point four, without eternity, all consequences under naturalism, whether good or bad, are ultimately meaningless and nihilistic. In the end, death wins. But why think that God provides a better explanation for objective moral values? I believe that a proper foundation for value must have certain features. For one, it must be eternal, necessary, and changeless. This way, it would exist just as a brute fact of reality, unlike human reality. The fact that it's changeless means that it is not arbitrary or contingent on time. It would also probably be personal. Why? Because if value is just an abstraction like numbers, then it should apply equally to everything. But it seems obvious to us that humans have more value than things that are inanimate. And so if the highest form of value is found in persons instead of non-persons, then it is likely that the source of that value is itself a person. A personal being could choose to create things with value and other things without value. Therefore, morality is likely grounded in a timeless, changeless necessarily existing personal being, and this we call God. Thirdly, I think God is the best explanation for the miraculous. Although it is often asserted that miracle claims are rare and unreliable, modern data has showed us this view is untenable. 55% of American doctors claim to have witnessed a miracle, and atheist physicians like doc Dr. Jacqueline Duffin have documented healing miracles performed by the Catholic Church. The chief miracle claim of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Surprisingly, the majority of scholars, whether they be Christian, Jewish, atheist, etc., will agree that Jesus was crucified, was buried by the Sanhedrin, that his tomb was found empty by women, and that both allies and enemies claim to see Jesus after his death, and that this belief differed drastically from cultural expectations. Naturalistic explanations fail to explain uh, accurately the belief. But is this appealing to a miracle simply by an argument from ignorance? It implies it. Uh, clearly, the historical Jesus associated himself with God. He saw himself as some kind of prophet and an agent of the divine. And so, the conclusion of his disciples that God had raised him from the dead is centered around the background information that this event occurred. Therefore, I believe the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead is the best explanation for the event and therefore implication of the existence of a personal God. Fourthly, and lastly, I will argue that belief in God is warranted through personal experience. In philosophy, there are notions called properly basic beliefs. These are things that cannot be demonstrated empirically rational to believe. This includes things like the reality of the external world, the passage of time, the reliability of memories, morals, etc. I can't prove that I'm sitting here right now having a debate. For all I know, it's at least possible that I'm dreaming or that I'm in a simulation. But it seems so obvious to me that I really am here and I am dreaming and that, or, sorry, that I'm not dreaming, and that I am having a real debate. I don't need any argument to justify that. In the same way, having a religious experience feels the same to me. 
it is possible that I'm being deceived, but unless I'm given positive justification to believe otherwise, then I am perfectly within my rights to accept my experience as legitimate. The argument can be stated as follows. P beliefs are justified through experience alone, as long as there is no sufficient defeater. Premise two, the existence of God or gods is a properly basic belief. Therefore, it follows the ex existence of God is justified through experience alone, as long as there is no sufficient defeater. Now, the argument is technically valid, but one may ask if it's sound. P1 I already explained in the opening paragraph. But what about P2? There are good reasons for thinking that belief in God is intuitive and not something that is taught, at least at its core. Certain tenets of religion, of specific religions, are taught, but general belief in God is intuitive. Neuroscience has shown that humans ha have in our brains what's called a hypersensitive agency detection, which means that we naturally associate supernatural agency to the natural world. Likewise, psychologists like Justin Baird of Oxford University have demonstrated that newborn babies intuitive, intuitively believe in supernatural agents from as early as a few months old without having to be taught. These, among other reasons, imply that belief in God and in the supernatural is generally intuitive to the human race, and thus a properly basic belief. This does not automatically make the belief true, but according to the argument I presented, it does mean that we are warranted in trusting our intuitions until we are given positive reasons for rejecting them. Therefore, in conclusion, I have presented four arguments for why I believe that the existence of God is a warranted belief. Thank you very much. All right, Jason, you're up, buddy. You can start whenever you'd like. Excellent. So let me see here. Um, so first, thank you for having me on the show here. I think any time that you can get uh, two opposing ideas together uh, to find some sort of common ground is always beneficial. Um, so like most participants that take part in these types of debates. I, I doubt that either one of us is really going to change each other's mind. But the real benefit of doing this is, is so, you know, people watching can, you know, really get a good idea. Maybe they're on the edge or they're not really sure what to do or where to go, you know. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm tempted to um, uh, go half and half with my uh, opening statement and rebuttal. It's it's slightly hard to not up the two, but I'll 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 do my best here. Um, so we're talking about if there's any sufficient evidence uh, to, be, you know, believe in a God. And um, if I had to be a little bit more specific, I, I did not start my timer here. So I'm going to do that. Um, thank God my beginning was just saying hello. So um, one thing that I want to point out is if, if I had to be a little bit more specific about what my my position is, I would say that I, I, I personally have not yet heard any sufficient evidence to warrant the belief in a God for quite, quite a few reasons. Um, and even those reasons are always in response to a, a claim of some sort and I'll and I'll get to that momentarily um now are there reasons to believe in God um probably um there, there's probably a lot of reasons um and are there good re reasons to believe in God uh, I believe at times there may have been a good reason to believe in God um at one time it was reasonable to believe that uh, the 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 sun was going around the earth. And the, why why would someone believe this? Because that's what it would look like. And at, at, a, at a specific time, they had sufficient evidence uh, to be in that position. Um, you, can, you can have sufficient evidence, I believe, and still find out that you're incorrect by technically not having it anymore when you're presented with something else. Um, but what we're talking about, which is really important here, is um, a couple of presuppositional fallacies in the arguments that, that you're presenting. So when we're making a supernatural claim, there's kind of a, uh, a, a paradox that you're facing here. Um, if, if, if I take two events that, um, that you, you can't really explain and... Um, Let's say you have two balls right in front of you. One of them's floating. Uh, they're both floating. 
and one of them can be explained by science, and, and one of them is quite literally a supernatural entity floating in the air. So this ball is floating by means of supernatural, whatever the supernatural would mean for you. And uh, because that would be the definition of the supernatural is outside of whatever is natural. Um, and, and the one that has a scientific explanation is easily explainable, but we don't yet have an explanation for it. Now, at this point, there's no way to tell the two apart. And we, we have no way to tell the two apart. And that's why you get things like uh, Jesus and comparative mythology. This is uh, something where this is something that um, where people are discussing the narrative of religion, the narrative of Jesus and other characters like Jesus. Um, it's 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 interesting how how the discussion of religion has developed over the years. And I I, I think sometimes if somebody lived from two thousand years ago to now. I believe they would see it a little bit differently. They would see the changes as time, as uh, they would see, um, you know, the thunder doesn't clap because of Thor anymore, you know. Um, and w if I wasn't able to get have your opening statement or access to, you know, the arguments you have there, is, is there is there a way to put it up on the screen? Um, because. Uh, let me see here. Let me get rid of this. I'm going to... Excellent. I'm going to go into something here. Um, Sims Razor is... Uh, um, can can you hear me, Caleb? Uh, we're, we're not allowed to do any crosstalk at this not moment, really, are we? <laughs> I'll... I was going right into... So, um, we have a problem with Occam's Razor, which is... Um, uh, the easiest solution is, and, and that's not what Occam's razor says. Um, Occam's razor is not to multiply entities unnecessarily. So when we're talking about, um, it, you know, uh, uh, it's it's reasonable to accept a claim. We're we're, we're not talking about um, the. Uh, so, so sorry here. The the opposite of a claim isn't making another claim. It's, to not accept a position that you would rest in as a default position, which is to not really take any side at all. Um, so we have, uh, um, why can't the universe be necessary? Um, is the universe necessary? Was it necessary? I, I'm, I don't really know if the universe is necessary. Um, a, a necessary existing thing must be timeless. Um, I don't know of anything that is necessary. A lot of these take a position of um, of uh, undemonstrable things. Um, for example, like free will. Like, no, you you can't prove that we're living in the real world. So, uh, free will for anybody else, you know, you're you're you find out that everything you were living is a dream, or the the Matrix now in more modern times. So. Um, let me see what my time is at. Okay, so um, imagine, you imagine you would. I'll give okay, you a okay. Warning. You're good on time. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So now, this is the interesting part with this. So imagine I wake you up in the new reality, and I say the the, the life you've been living is completely fake. Um, you would still be able to ask the question, is this life the real life? And now we have another paradox here where you'll, you, you can never really get to the end. But more importantly, is this re the real reality? I, I don't know. I haven't been given any reason to, to think otherwise. Or uh, I haven't been given any reason to believe there, there, there is a reason to, to think otherwise. Uh, and the default position on that is, um, for me, I, I don't know. Um, when, when we're talking about a paradox of that nature, uh, there, there, was these, there was these points that you brought up that was timeless, changeless, uh, necessary, um, and, can, and you had a fourth one. Um, so necessary... Yes, but but the other ones not necessarily. Um, I don't know which one it was. Um, properly properly basic beliefs. Now, 
I understand what properly basic beliefs are. And the, and the closest thing that I can compare it to is, um, is uh, a, a, an axiom, maybe. But I don't really think God would be a properly basic belief. Um, we know of civilizations that have no God. They have no language. They have nothing of that nature. Um, it, when you take the example of uh, the baby or the child, um, babies, humans don't develop a theory of mind until after two years old. Um, but how would you demonstrate that a baby had these thoughts or, or these ideas? Um, there, there's no way to demonstrate this. I, I don't know who would have done a, a study of that nature. Um, but uh, how many people have done a study of this nature and could put all of their claims together because the plural of analogy is is not evidence and uh it becomes an argument from popularity when 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 using it um and uh but the one point i want to go back to is belief versus not belief uh and this is um where you take up one position versus another instead of rejecting both um, and really keeping yourself in a position of a default position until you have sufficient evidence because evidence is different from a reason. Um, that's good. That's Yeah, I'm good. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, now we're <laughs> going to be uh, doing 10-minute rebuttals. And, and Caleb, uh, take it away, brother. Give me like five seconds to go grab something. I'll have <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Caleb's grabbing stuff. Uh, Jason, anything else you want to say about this? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, you ready, sir? No. This is actually really cool. This is the first time I've done this type of platform. Andy, actually. Yeah, well, you know, you're on Skype now, but what you don't see is that you're on a whole different software as well. So it, even if you looked at your phone and checked the YouTube live, that's how you that's how it's looking to everybody else, which is pretty cool. You, can you do can't it. prove that. You can <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> All right. Caleb, are you ready, my friend? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. I'm putting your 10 minutes on. You guys are way under your times, by the way. So that's OK. Yep, that's it's fun. all good. More time to talk. All right. All right. Go ahead, Caleb. All right. So I had rebuttal slides, but just for the time to take, I'm not going to use them because I have it all written down. So it's fine. So I'm going to try to go in order here. I think the first thing he said is difference between belief and not belief. There might not be good reasons. There might there might have used to be good reasons. And he gives the example of uh, the sun going around the earth, which sounds to me like a little bit of a appealing to like, oh, God of the gaps. We used to have good reasons. Now stuff explains it. Um, I'm not sure if that's what he was implying, but he can maybe clear that up in the rebuttal or the cross-examination. Uh, secondly, he said, can a belief be shown, can it be shown to be incorrect? And he mentions presuppositional fallacies. Well, I think that's why I look at it and determine what are good presupp, because everyone has presuppositions. But I did not lay out specifically a presuppositional argument. Um, a presuppositional argument would be saying that logic cannot exist without God, and I, I haven't made that claim. Yes, certain premises of an argument do require certain presuppositions, but um, I think, as he mentioned earlier, some of them are axiomatic, but we can discuss some particular ones later on. Um, then he said uh, we can't really test the supernatural, or he gave the example of the balls. And I, I mentioned that in my opening statement, actually. Like, yes, we can't know for sure, but the background and cultural claims are what makes a difference. So one random event that happens and out of a specific event that's tied to a particular um, cultural or significant thing, that increases the probability of it being divine intervention. If someone uh, does a particular act of healing that's unexplainable and they pray, prayer by definition is acting, uh, asking a supernatural agent to intervene on your behalf and do something that looks impossible. Um, that doesn't prove it necessarily, but it does increase the probability so that we're not just appealing to God for no reason. It has to be within the proper context. He then mentioned um, briefly comparable with mythology with Jesus. Um, maybe he can elaborate a little on that a little bit more. Um, when he said that, that made me think a little bit of the eight, or, sorry, 19th century scholars who tried to compare Jesus with people like Osiris and Horus and Mithras and others. But generally, that's a very outdated view. Um, it was back in the 1920s is when it started becoming unpopular. 
And um, nowadays, what's, it's what's called the Jewish reclamation of Jesus that started in the 70s, which says that the best way to uh, analyze the historical Jesus is through first century Judaism, not through paganism and Hellenism. Uh, now, it's generally a very outdated view. Um, he mentions default positions and simpler. Oh, no, sorry, I just skipped one. He mentions Occam's razor and that it's, uh, it doesn't multiply entities beyond necessity. I would agree. That's, a, that's what I meant to say, but he just set, worded it in a better definition than I could. Um, but I would also say that my cosmological argument does uh, use that same principle because I'm saying God as a single entity is a better explanation than multiple necessary physical states like the laws of physics, like the uh, materials of matter, all of the different properties. You get many more ne necessary brute facts versus a simple one brute fact. And so I would say Occam's razor would apply because we're not multiplying entities beyond necessity. So positing one is a better explanation. He mentions default positions, and that goes back to um, uh, the properly basic beliefs. I would not say naturalism is a default position, but we'll get into that in just a second. He says, I don't know if anything is necessary. Well, I agree that we can't know for certain, but the reason we should have good uh, ideas as to what would be necessary is because I think the idea of an infinite regress of contingent things would itself just be left unexplained, right? Even if you had this whole chain and everything in it was contingent, I can ask, well, why does that chain exist at all if it's possible that it couldn't have existed? If it's necessary, then there you go. No, it has to exist. But if it's not necessary, then we're still left with the question, why does it exist? And although someone might appeal to saying we don't know, I do think that's special pleading because in our natural world, we have explanations for many things. We don't just uh, seek out anomalies and say, well, it's unexplained. We at least try to explain them. And so I think it would just be um, special pleading to say certain things are unexplained and certain things are not. Or at least there's a difference between having the explanation that we don't know what it is versus not having the explanation at all. And I'm saying that everything probably has an explanation. It's either contingent on something that we might not know or it's necessary. So that would be a reason why I think necessity is a, a metaphysical principle that has to exist. He says, um, going back to the properly basic beliefs, real reality, we don't have any reason to think otherwise. Um, I would agree, and that's why I brought up uh, properly basic beliefs. They are axioms, and I think that's a good word for it. Um, he's correct that we can't prove that, you know, if, if I woke up from a dream, how do I know the world I'm in right now is in a dream? Well, we don't know that for certainty, and so I don't on that particular point. Um, we're not asserting these things with absolute certainty. We could be wrong, but Jason is correct that unless we are given sufficient defeaters otherwise, we don't have to be skeptical of it. Properly basic beliefs are the one things that you don't really have to give positive arguments for simply because it's so intuitive and so obvious you kind of have to start from there. Um, he talks about how he said he doesn't think God is... So he agrees with the first premise of that argument, but he denies the second one, which is that God is not a properly basic belief. He points out that there are tribes and people groups who don't believe in God. This is true, but they are definitely a minority. And I'm not just appealing to um, populist beliefs, right? I think when we look at, um, we ask the questions are functioning properly. I don't mean like mental illness, but um, for example, a blind person um, um, might feel the world around him and he has senses that are not functioning properly. But he can conclude most people in the world probably aren't blind because they wouldn't be able to help him out. They wouldn't be able to do things. Same with a colorblind person, right? Um, beliefs that are not functioning properly tend to be in the minority. If it is true that the majority of beliefs are not functioning properly, they're not uh, accessible to the real world, then that would make our entire sense of self, we'd have to be skeptical of everything in our minds because it would just mean that evolution is not a reliable process for making true beliefs. But I think it is a reliable process for making true beliefs, and so I think the beliefs that we're given, um, including beliefs in God, believe. He also asked, how would you test that on babies? I was quoting from this book uh, from Dr. Justin Barrett of Oxford, and he basically, they did a bunch of studies, he cites us several ones, uh, of I think that how they would interact and how they would believe um, in supernatural agency. So uh, he, he proposes that b babies have a belief in the supernatural, and then later on adults fill in the specifics of that belief. And it's not just other ones. I mean, Daniel Dennett, who's a pretty well-known atheist, also would probably agree that we are born intuitively to believe in the religious things. And this has evolutionary benefits. For example, people who are religious tend to have more children, and that makes sense as far as population growth because evolution wants to propagate um, DNA. Uh, oh, shoot, I forgot what I was going to say. How am I on time, by the way, David? Okay. Um, I think that's what I was going to end it on. Um, yeah, I don't think I have any. I forgot the last thing I was going to say. But, uh, yeah, I enjoyed this, and I look forward to what uh, Jason has to say. All right, Jason. Well, your 10 minutes starts whenever your first word uh, hits the mic. 
Alrighty. So, um, <clears throat> you said, uh, you know, when I was pointing out the ga- uh, the God of the Gaps, um, yes, yes, that that is the God of the Gaps, actually. That is what I was getting to. That was my point. Um, anytime you put a supernatural uh, answer into a spot, um, and that supernatural answer is God, that is by definition the God of the Gaps. Um, and uh, test testimonial evidence of any kind stacked against each other does not improve the probability of any claim or proposition or conclusion. Um, And uh, even if a religion versus one other religion compared with each other, um, if they give the same evidence, um, the the same reasons, if they're they're equal, and it really doesn't matter if they're outdated. Um, If something is true, or not true. It, it's not gonna. It's not. It's not gonna matter what date it is, or how old it is, or how new it is. Um, so one of the one of the one of the interesting things that you you brought up was uh, God versus physics. Um, uh, that it's a better explanation for 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 naturalism. One of the most important things to understand is there's there's philosophical naturalism and methodological naturalism. Now method. Logical naturalism is philosophical naturalism is easier to explain first. Philosophical naturalism is the this is my camera. How about that? Uh, I'm I'm looking at you guys on the screen here. Philosophical naturalism is the position that the supernatural does not exist. Um, that's not what I would describe myself. I would say methodological naturalism is the position that I. This is not the position that the supernatural does not exist. It, the default position is, is to not know. Um, I don't know is not special pleading. Uh, spe- the uh, special pleading fallacy, like any other fallacy, applies to arguments. Um, I don't know is not an argument. It's not a claim. Um, the position of I don't know isn't even alone by itself, good, bad, or anything, you know, uh, unless you're examining something specific. Um, I, you were talking about the first premise that I agreed with. I, I, I forgot which one that was. Um, but, uh, you were talking about how I brought up, um, what, what was was it the um the paraha is a, is a tribe that doesn't have a language or a concept of god or anything of that nature and um you're, you're talking about well that's that's a minority that's only one state you know it that's the point um it you will to the contrary to 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 demonstrate a blanket statement to be false um when you say this is a rule and you provide an example that contradicts that rule um that's how you show a blanket statement to, to be false. Um, I We're not born to believe in God. We're not born to be, believe in specific supernatural ideas. We, we're born to, to basically learn. Um, the reason why we have the skepticism now is because we're descendants of people that had this skepticism. Um, we are scared of the bush because our descendants were scared of the bush and those that weren't ended up dead. Um, and so the idea of having too much skepticism here or too much skepticism there doesn't really, really make sense because your your evidence is always proportional to the belief. Uh, and um, so a minority wouldn't matter. Um, and it, if you want to just go back and forth, that's 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 a lot easier. Um, sure, guys. I mean, we can end that right now The uh, and, and go straight to cross-examination, and you guys can have a conversation, or you can – we could split the time. I think it, I think at this point, though, you guys want to ask yeah. each other questions and talk about this. So I would say just have an informal dialogue. We, had a, we have a lot of – Yeah, a cross-exam. Yeah. So uh, who wants to start? Caleb, uh, since you're the one that goes first and he's uh, going to get the last word, I'm going to let you go first. Yeah, you're good. I've been writing all this down, so I'm trying to think of what we're going to go in order of what was brought up or what. Okay. Um, so, uh, he, again, he mentioned the God of the Gaps, which uh, is how I, so I was correct in, in that interpretation. And that's where I tried to emphasize the, um, the context behind it, right? And this goes a little bit into, I think, 
I was a little bit confused what you're talking about with testimonial evidence and contradicting religions. I wasn't entirely sure what you're trying, if you want to uh, clarify part of that. Um, okay, the testimonial evidence. Now, um, testimony, say that again? What, 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 which specific idea? You brought up something about testimonial evidence and contradicting religions, I think. That's what I wrote down. I, and I didn't really understand where you were going with what you meant by that. Uh, I didn't know if you were talking um, about the, miracles or if you are talking about something else. Um, yeah, so I, I did say that te testimonial evidence proved uh, the probability of a claim or, or, uh, or circumstance. Um, testimonial evidence, um, which isn't really reliable or reliable even in court, um, isn't really an effective, an effective means of finding out what is true. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't improve the probability of a circumstance. So if someone wanted to evaluate the probability that Julius Caesar was stabbed by Brutus, would we not have to use testimonial evidence to assess that? Yeah, well, you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't really use probability to assess something like that because we're, we're talking about a single action that right. somebody was stabbed I mean, right. you could use the pro you could find out what's the probability of a historical nature of that being true or accurate uh -huh. but I, I i don't really know how you would apply probability to um in an idea like that um well i think this all morning this sorry go ahead Oh, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think all of history is probabilistic because you can't, it's not as demonstrable as science and it's not as certain as logic. But the most of history, especially ancient history, is based on someone was here, they told us what happened, and we have to take their word for it. Mm. And you also have archaeology occasionally. Uh, I'm not saying that means it's all accurate, but we have methods for assessing it. We don't just take everyone's word for it. There are, way, there are different criteria for assessing what's probably historic and what's probably not. But I just wanted to emphasize, like, I think the idea that testimony can't be. Well, I, I, I even say it can't be used as evidence, but I think in certain fields, history being one of them, that's the one I appeal to with the stuff about Jesus because that's you know what we have. Um, I think that is what you would have to use uh, in order to to assess that. But why 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 would why would you why would you have to? I mean I mean if do you, do we would we have to for every like Zeus as well? I mean well. Yeah, I mean, that's what genre matters as well, right? But I, I mean, Jesus of Nazareth was a, it's more analogous to someone like Socrates or Apollonius of Tiana, right? I mean, Zeus was a mythological person who was never, at least, a, whether or not you believe Jesus was God, I mean, at least the consensus is he was a historical person. So that, that, that is just, that, I'm sorry. that is, that is the presuppositional fallacy right, right there. Um, from, from, from the default position, you you have two equal characters that, be, be, because what you're saying is, well, you know, Zeus Zeus is is the mythological character. We're we're talking about Jesus, um, to to even justify that comparison in that way is 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 uh, assuming the truth of that which you're attempting to demonstrate. Right, but they don't just just look at it and say, oh, here's two characters, let's pick Jesus. I mean, there are historical reasons for affirming. One is it's like why why should we think that Josephus existed or why should we think that um, John the Baptist or Caiaphas exists or Pilate right I mean it, we don't they don't just look at every character in history and try to decide who is real and who isn't right? no. there are ways to yeah yeah they they apply different standards of evidence um, and that uh -huh. that's what's really important so right. the evidence yeah. that you would apply to determine whether or not George Washington existed or whether Caesar existed right. uh, um, is is different to determine whether a a god existed um, mm -hmm. for example um, there's a lot of historical characters out there um, like leaders and um, there are leaders that I know of today right now um, there is and we would both agree with this right yes and um, there are there have been a lot of gods out there, and mm -hmm. we would both agree that they are most likely or not true. Correct? Yes. Okay, so really, we're on equal footing there. It's just Jesus specifically. So what you might be looking for is what, what method are you using to determine that Christianity oh is 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 correct, or the fact that there is a God versus what? Okay, so I think I understand what you're saying a little bit better now because I, I was trying to to understand that. So that's a good question. 
Um, first of all, I would like to say in this debate, I'm not specifically arguing. Of course, I am a Christian, but that's you know we could we could assume the Christian. It doesn't have to be the Christian God for the sake of this. Okay, okay. Debate. It Christian. But I am. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but I am arguing. But you're right. I am arguing <laughs> that God performed a miracle in the case of Jesus. So that that is technically directly related to okay. what I was presenting earlier. So you're not wrong about that. Um, so. That's a good, and that's why I brought up historical criteria. Um, I didn't go into it, unfortunately, but I had it on a slide that I didn't bring up. Um, and that's where you have things like multiple attestation, early attestation, criterion of embarrassment, criterion of dissimilarity, et cetera. So, I mean, th this is why, and when I was saying the consensus, I didn't mean I wasn't trying to appeal to ad populum because it's not a fallacy if it's a legitimate authority and if they have good reasons for affirming it. So there's lots of, if you want to go into the historical arguments, we can. I have a 300-page book that, that delves into all of that. Um, shameless plug, I know, but uh, I just, I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't know how to evaluate the difference between two religious books. Um, you know, oh, yeah, uh, that's, a, well, that's a good point, though. I think to make a distinction of when we say religious books uh, is the term of genre, right? Of of what exactly when you when you re pick up a book about uh, I don't know, like Paul Bunyan, right? And then you pick up a book about George Washington. How do you know which one is historical and which one is a fable? And that's why genre is important. Are they trying to tell a true story or is this a, a fable of some kind? And so that's where you have to look into what they are. And the Bible is not a single book, especially in the New Testament, right? These are a collection of letters that were written, the biographies that were written at a certain time period. And then 300 years later, they put them all under one cover and called it the New Testament. So when we look at the genre of it, we can at least say that these people believe that they were reporting historical information about a person. Now, they could be wrong about that, and we'd have to get into that. But that's well, at least the difference between the two. Well, I, I wouldn't say that's that's it. I mean, I, I think that's on the right track. Yeah, we, we 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 don't intuitively just know that that Paul Bunyan didn't mm -hmm. exist and he's a mythological character right. and, and God isn't um, th that that's starting from the position of, uh, uh, you know, obviously God exists. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's Jesus and he's to be put on a, on a different level as, as, as someone else. So obviously Paul, but you know, and there's different genres. Um, if, if you're of either one of these names, you could mix the genres up and nobody would know, um, what was real or fake in, until they opened up the book. You could, unless and that's why there's method help at least for it. Determining, right? I mean, scholars don't just look at it and just guess, right? They're, we have ways of what it isn't, but yeah, just, yeah. And I'm asking. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Well, I was going to say just to clarify. I when I when I'm quoting the, I'm not saying that most scholars think that Jesus was God. That that's that would not be true at all. I'm just saying that most scholars would agree with Jesus being a historical a historical teacher from Galilee, being crucified, as being buried, and all the other stuff I mentioned. Uh, they they don't alter the explanations of how something like that could have occurred, which I would have problems with. But um, they don't, most of them don't necessarily consist the whole story as mythology. Mythology would be more in line with what you said of being Zeus, right? But we have other characters who are not mythological in, in similar situations. And so that's why I think it's important to look at the methodologies. Um, I didn't want to spend too much on this particular topic. So do you want to keep talking about this or do you want to move on to some of the other things that you brought up it, in your it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't surprise me it wouldn't surprise me if 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 somebody by the name of Jesus existed that was a okay. teacher and you know that's uh, all I was asking religion and okay. things of that nature yeah <laughs> okay, no perfect. no yeah yeah um what I'm saying is um uh so we have the scientific method um and uh we use that to investigate reality and the world around us um how is the method that that you use for this this current claim here, uh, what what is the method methodology that's through to determine uh, uh, your 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 claim that there is enough sufficient evidence? To How do you determine it was, it's sufficient? That it was supernatural agency. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, if you're using science, if you're using uh -huh. science and the and the methods that that we use, like um, uh, there was a couple of things you said up about logic and science, and I think, um, I'm going to take a drink here. No, you're good. I'll take one, too. Water. Um, there was a couple of things you said about um, logic and science, you know, uh, being true, and um, mm. uh, I don't remember what that was specifically. So um, logic itself, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with, you know, what is true or not true. It, it really it, it really is just 
a, a tool that determines whether or not an argument could demonstrate the claim it attempts to make. And what's the best way to phrase this? It, it really says that if you believe this and if you believe this, you by definition are irrational if you also do not believe this, assuming it was considered both valid and sound. So right, yeah. um, uh, you take you take the God, you believe in God, right? Um, obviously. I would and, hope so um, from, this art, from this debate. Yeah, yes. the methodology <laughs> that you're using, mm -hmm. the methodology that you're using for to demonstrate his evidence, feeding the evidence through. What methodology is it and how does it work? Well, it would depend on the argument. So for the third one I gave, the resurrection, that would be more historical based. For the other three I gave, um, one of them was, well, the cosmological was purely philosophical. The moral was purely philosophical. The probably basic was mo mostly philosophical with a little bit of neuroscience and psychology thrown in. So different methods. But to, to bring up one thing you said, you're talking about the scientific method which is great, but yes. I, I would like to point out that I, I think this in supernatural agency, sci, when we examine something scientifically, we, we assume, or I'm sorry, it applies to closed systems, right? So when you say that a certain, we talked about this on the phone, I remember this, when you talk about mm -hmm. certain laws, they apply on, on conditions that nothing is interfering. So you have the Newton balls, theoretically they should be transferring energy forever and ever, but because of air resistance and stuff, it slows down. So it's not a closed system. So when you look at the natural world, right, it is true that under natural world with no interference, it should go this way. However, what Theism is proposing is that there is an agent coming in and interfering and doing it. So it's like um, if I throw a ball, we can project physically how it's going to travel if we know the conditions. But if I, mm -hmm. if someone jumps in front and catches it in the middle of it, that's going to mess up our predict because we have an interfering agent, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have interference mm -hmm. of that kind, that is when um, – it's a little bit tougher. So that is typically what the person who is arguing for miracles is proposing, is that God is coming in as an agent and interfering. And that is why. So we can't, you're right that we can't predict or we can't necessarily test like when God will do this, but we can test of the, the aftermath of that, of what it looks like. And is it possible that there was interference of some kind by some entity? And then the you know, context... How do you, how do you determine... How do you determine it was an interference in the in the first place? Right. Like, That's why I inf uh, tried to emphasize the uh, cultural context. Right. So I gave the example of prayer of, and you know I don't mean like a general. I pray something broad, like my mom will get better and she does. Like let's say a super specific prayer. Like um, there was one in the journal Complementary Theories in Medicine where a girl who was legally blind um, went to a Pentecostal pastor. She was healed instantaneously. She went to the doctors and this is all on the um, medical journal. I can send it to you if you want later on. And they were going through the alternatives. They said, this probably wasn't a placebo. This probably wasn't all these things. So in that situation, we have a person asking for divine, I mean, prayer is divine agents. It's, act, it's asking a divine being to interfere in some way. That is what prayer is by definition. So in that context, because he was asking for an interference and it looks like Maybe this was a situation where there was interference. We can infer. What if there were aliens? What if there were aliens pretending to be God? Well, that's a possibility, but that would be ad hoc because you'd have to give another reason why that would be aliens pretending to be God in the cultural context, right? So that's possible for but the same for all the same reasons. No, because divine agency is. Or sorry, prayer is not usually appealing to alien. If someone is praying to an alien to do something like that and it happened. You could, but typically, well, most well, people. Well, my son can. My son can, you know, talk to the tooth fairy. But I'm going to put the dollar under his pillow. Right. Right. Yes. Exactly. But in that situation, we have a naturalistic explanation. We can we can look at all the factors and say, okay, but because it looks more like you're doing it and not the tooth fairy, we can say that it was probably you and not agency. So you have to look at these on a case by case basis. Right. Yes, yeah. And it yes. depends on the circumstances. So what is that? What is what is the one here? How do you tell the difference between uh, uh, a, a pocket watch um, mm -hmm. on the beach and the stick next to it. Um, it, it, it what, what you're doing is you're starting with position that there is an interferer, that, that there is something interfering. And when you, you see a rock fall, obviously you, you agree, we know that that's gravity. Um, and when you're talking about something coming in and tweaking the natural world, um, get, can you give an example of, of this? Like, well, cause when you're talking about the girl with, with, with prayer, um, I, I, I'm thinking of, of many other, 
many other uh, things that can answer that can not explain. I don't want to use the word explain because, it, you know, um, something with explanatory power helps you understand something better. Right. And I, I, you know, when, when you, when you put, when you put God in this, in I, I don't have the information on mind here, but mm -hmm. um, there are, there, there are, but, but I can also send you one from a Hindu man sure. from their doctors sure. and he, and that's from this guy. So Jason, right. now, is the, that, Jason, am I understanding yeah. it that like you're having trouble with the overall starting point? Like how do you get theism at all, right? Like you're having a whole problem with the starting point where Caleb's coming from, right? Like how – yeah. Sure, is sure. That, is that, what I'm, get, is that what, what I'm getting from you? Is that there's a, there's a trouble with, yeah, with that, the starting yeah. point at all? You know, like there's, there's an issue with, with even assuming theism before you start, you know, type of idea. Right, Caleb. Yeah. I think yeah. you covered I, that in properly basic beliefs. Why don't we? Why don't you unpack that a little bit? I mean, I don't want to step on y'all's conversation, sure, but I, sure. I, I don't want you guys. That's a good idea. No, that's actually. Yeah, I want you to. Yeah, because there's one, warranted belief. Let me say one thing. Yeah. Let me say one thing to what Jason said, okay. and then we can go into that. Uh, he, he was bringing up a. I, he didn't finish his thing, so a, a Hindu healing thing. I would say two things. First, we have to look on a case by case basis. So I would have to see the particular things. And if that turns out to be the case, I'm perfectly open to miracles and other religions. I, because I, again, the premise of this is does God exist? So, for all I know, pluralism could be true. I'm not saying I think it is, but a pluralist probably wouldn't be against miracles in many religions. There's some very interesting ones where thousands of people can see the Virgin Mary, and it was investigated. There were photographs that, and I'm not Catholic. I can't explain well, and I haven't looked into them enough. So. Again, I'm not against that being a possibility. You know, I try to stay open-minded. Um, so you want to talk about they, properly they basic are. belief. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I want absolutely. you to get to the starting Should point be. because that's where I'm seeing you guys having the difficulty here. You're kind of speaking past each other. Uh, uh -huh. And I think Jason has a problem yeah, I don't, at the beginning I, of everything. Your whole initial presupposition that there is a God at all. Like, how do you come uh -huh. to that conclusion? Uh, my guess, and this so is my I, guess, I would be like, you know, God's the hypothesis here. And, you know, he's saying uh -huh. through experience, just kind of like what the founders of the United States said. There's certain things that are properly basic. There's certain things that are like self-evident. OK, and there's some mm -hmm. things that and, and that's why I said, Caleb, why don't you go back to properly basic beliefs and, and give us an explanation on what those type of things are. You're a reformed epistemologist, so you should be good at this. <laughs> David's not here. He would he would be ripping into me. Yeah, <laughs> just to yeah, specify, I love you, guys. I, I love you, reform epistemologists too. <laughs> I agree with Jason to an extent. Of I don't think you can posit an agent that is not a, 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 a plausible expert. If I say, oh, what what caused this, and I say it was a, a goggling, and you say, well, what is a goggling? Right, that doesn't help us because we just don't know what it is. So that's why I start when I was presenting my argument. I did start with two other arguments for God before I went to the miracle argument. So I, I was trying to give reasons for thinking that God is an age as a personal agent who might be involved in the world and then go into, here's a specific case where he might've been involved. So that's, that's why I try to bring up two other arguments before I got into that one. But yeah, if we what, want to talk what, about, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. What, what, let's go over what a properly basic belief that, okay. that you believe exists because I, I, I think, I think, um, I think the only, the only thing that fits in that category that I can think of are the logical absolutes. Okay. I think, well, we have to define what we mean by properly basic, right? So I, I would say there are logical, logical absolutes cannot be wrong, right? We are certain that those are right. Just there's no way, like two plus two could not equal six, right? Properly well, I, basic. I would never, I, me, me, even me and the wife have a rule that you're never allowed to say 100% certain on anything. Well, but I think that, <laughs> I mean, I think you can be at least 100% certain of your own existence, right? Because if you say I'm not 100% certain, you're already automatically presupposing you exist. Yeah, I so think, I, I think, I think Descartes was on the right track, at least okay. in that sense. I, right. I can doubt my existence. So in some form, I must uh -huh. exist at least. <laughs> All right. We agree, we agree with that. So properly basic beliefs are a step down from that level of certainty of saying we are not certain about these beliefs, but they seem intuitively obvious to us. So that's mm -hmm. things like the external world, um, moral beliefs I would throw in, belief in time, belief that our memories aren't false, stuff like that, stuff that I can't prove, I can't demonstrate without begging the question, but it just seems, 
I can't prove that I'm here in front of you talking and that I'm not in illusion, but it seems sure. I, I don't have any reason to think that I'm not. And so that my experience is just justification. It just seems so obvious to me that I don't have to, even if I could be wrong. Right. So that's so what I mean. So by, you're saying, so you're saying you're, you're born with these beliefs. I think, yeah, I think that properly basic beliefs are things you are born with and that are just intuitive that you don't have to be taught. Right. Things that are yeah, just, they're, they're, they're not. Um, I can, if, if let's say I had a time machine, if I go back in time and get somebody from 2000 years ago and bring them to where I'm at right now, they will not intuitively think that I'm just talking to you through Skype. <laughs> They're going to think I put you in the screen. Um, and it's, and it's because of the way that beliefs occur. Beliefs, beliefs are not a choice. We don't decide right. what we believe and what we don't believe. Uh, beliefs are comprised of three major components, uh, which, um, is the stuff that, that you know now, um, the stuff this, I'm, I, when I say no, I'm, I'm speaking very colloquially. Um, mm -hmm. so there's the stuff that we know now. There's the stuff that we're currently seeing and experiencing. And then mm -hmm. the third one is the manner in which these two interact with each other. And this right. is usually determined around childhood. Um, but there's no, I mean, you're not born with any of these intuitive beliefs of, of any of this nature. Um, it, it is taught and it is brought to you in some form or fashion. Well, so going back to the Skype thing for a second, I think that there's, I don't, I wouldn't say technology is an intuitive belief, right? I think that a person 2000 years ago would still, other people existed. Um, it would be a technological difference, but that doesn't mean no, that I'm no, not I'm asserting not, I'm, that. I'm not saying that they would, they would think that no one else existed. I'm saying yeah. they would think that I trapped you in uh -huh. my computer. Um, sure, but that, I'm not, that's I'm, what I'm, I'm not, saying. Right, but I wasn't. Skype is not a properly basic belief. It's not. That's something you have to be taught to understand how. Okay, that works. that's what I was responding to. You, yes. you, you said you said like you you gave an example when you were talking about properly basic beliefs. Like we intuitively know that we're talking here on the computer and back. Oh, okay. And I I said no, that's not that's not okay. Intuitive. Well, if that's if that's um, what you thought I meant that I that I, that was my clumsy wording of it. I meant if we were in person, I would have just said talking in front of you. I only bring up the computer because we're on the computer. But if we were sitting in the room in this in the same room talking, I would just say it seems obvious that I'm talking to you right now. So let me clear that up. I wasn't saying computers specifically. I'm saying the belief um, in other people. Of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was that's that that's in very people. Yeah, that's very that's very limited. That's very when you when you're talking about intuitive beliefs, like if we're in the same room and you start talking to me, I intuitively know you're talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, I don't. Um, that that is not an intuitive belief. I I know it really seems like it is, but it, but it's not. And and the reason is is because, um, so, um, we're talking about something very specific, almost like smiling. Okay, now here's what's intuitive: you are doing something physical at me. That's what that's what's intuitive. Uh -huh. And that's that's obviously if I can hear or see. That's where the limit goes. That's where intuitive ends. Um, right. As far as, hey, you're speaking to me, you're communicating with me, um, that's not intuitive. Uh, that's learned behavior. That's um, that's uh, uh, social behavior. Okay, let's take out communication. Let's just say that I'm in the same room and I'm just looking at you. And so I believe, okay. that, I believe that you exist and that I'm in a room with you. That, that's sure. intuitive, right? Okay. That's, that's what oh, I was trying sure, to get sure. at. Yeah, so that's okay, why I listed okay. things. I'll, I'll say some of them again. I think like the belief in the external world, which would include you, right? The belief that sure. I'm not the only thing that exists. I think trees. I think I think that my senses are reliable. That when I see or smell something, that sure. I can take, I can trust them. Mm -hmm. I think that my memories are not. I don't think the world was created five minutes ago and all my memories are false. And I just think that it was. I have all these built in. Even that's a possibility. I don't think that's likely. I also. Actually, I, I did want to get into moral beliefs a little bit too, because I think that's the only argument we haven't talked about at all that I brought up. Because um, we talked a little bit cosmological, a lot about miracles, about this one. So I, I do want to get to that point uh, eventually. But I would say moral beliefs are, or at least I would say that the idea of human value is intuitive. How people interpret that and how they go about it is different. But the idea that human, that there should be value of some kind that should be respected, I think is, even if that's self value, right? Even if it's self preservation. Um, and other beliefs like belief in time, right? There are a lot of scientists, if you look at B theory, right, who say that time actually just it, everything is static and and nothing changes. Um, like that, it just seems intuitively obvious that that's not true. I'm not saying that they're wrong, but the belief that 
the past and the pre the, I'm sorry, the, the, that the present is real and the future doesn't exist yet seems super intuitive. That's not something you have to explain to someone. So stuff like that is what I was trying to mean. And so I lumped God in with that because of the supernatural. And by the way, you did you did bring up the uh, paraha, and I'm glad you did because if you actually look, they didn't don't they don't believe in a supreme spirit, but they did wear necklaces to ward off spirits. They did believe in supernatural agents to an extent. So I think it's a little bit misleading to say they didn't believe in anything, right? They they didn't believe in a particular god per se, but they didn't. No, I didn't say they didn't believe in anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, I, I know you didn't. I was just trying to clarify that for the audience. Um, so I don't think they're even that much of an exception. So if I had said they were an exception or a minority, then well, they're still in a minority. But I would that would be misleading on my part as well. So uh, and I think that's why when you look at cultures, I, even super isolated cultures don't interact with other cultures. It seems that almost all of them have some kind of concept of a spirit or God or something supernatural. Right. You don't have very I don't know too many cultures that are just naturally atheistic. Um, at least, like, yeah, every every. Every culture has um, has a supernatural. Now, I, I can't even say that. I wouldn't even make that claim. I mean, it's possible there's cultures that didn't have any supernatural. Every culture ideas. that we know that um, we are aware of, we could say that, that, that I'm personally aware of. Yes, yes. but I don't okay. think that that um, I I don't think that attributes to a supernatural being true in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know, I, I think you would have to demonstrate why. It does. Otherwise, it's an argument for popularity. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, and I wanted to get into that a little bit. So the idea is that because we have um, because we have eyes that can pick up the ex that can pick up light, we have the ears that pick up sound because our senses give us an um, an idea of how to understand the world around us. The idea is that we have because we have this sense of God. Right. Calvin called it a sense of inatatus. Just as we have senses to tell us that certain things in the external world exist, so also can we use this sense to just feel intuitively that. I don't. I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean by sense of God. You you included sight and sound and right. you know stuff like that, but then you said the sense of God, and mm -hmm. I that's that you kind of you know threw that one in there. I don't know what sense yeah. of God. Well, that's what that was. What my second premise was was I, when I brought up hyperactive agency detection in the brain, stuff like that. How our how our brains are hardwired to believe stuff like that 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 is the what i was referring to is that we have where our brains are wired we're, to our think. brains our brains are yeah, well there's a difference between our brains are hardwired to believe something like that or uh -huh. this which is not the case on anything but our brains are hardwired to learn in in yeah. specific ways um and uh we live by inference and induction and that's pretty much it as far as it goes um uh we don't intuitively we wouldn't intuitively come up with the same language or anything like that and th those right. things are not in intuitive uh so we we don't intuitively think of god we god is a very popular idea um but we're just thinking of an outside entity you mm -hmm. know what i mean it's not right. it's not intuitive in any way shape or form you don't think belief in the if, supernatural is intuitive no i don't um and, and the reason is is because we if you look at the way that the 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 humans develop um mm -hmm. we're still very young you know we're, we're still very young and science itself is only about 300 years um right. maybe and and that's that's kind of that's kind of hyperbolic but science in the sense that we know it is about 300 years old and um uh in the future it might the idea of the supernatural might just seem ridiculous um but the idea of gravity won't seem ridiculous um mm -hmm. our explanation of it might um or or theory of it might um mm -hmm. so um, but no i, I Go ahead. Go ahead. You want me to go ahead? I was going to let you finish what you're going to say. No, go go go, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. So so yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought up the whole like in the future thing because I I think when we look at um what causes belief, right? Because we evolved a certain way and we're, we're we develop beliefs to interact with the natural world. I, it, actually, if you look at Gallup polls, atheism is going down globally. It, it is shrink. It, or, sorry, na, uh, theism is shrinking in the West, but globally because Eastern countries populate faster. It's shrinking as a proportion of the whole world. And I bring that up to say that I don't think that religion is going to be going anywhere anytime soon because I think there are um, evolutionary benefits to being religious. Not only does it make you live longer, but I mentioned that um, 
statistically, they're far more likely to have uh, to produce offspring because they don't use birth control as much. They have different beliefs, uh, stuff like that. So if evolution is trying to preserve beliefs that cause more offspring to be produced, there's a good reason for it to preserve religious belief, right? So I don't see that as the, getting gotten rid of. Eva, that's not, that's not a tenet of evolution, to produce more offspring. That's the only tenet. To replicate. Yeah, that's the only tenet no, I've no, ever no. heard of. To re- <laughs> no, just- <laughs> No, 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 no. It's not to produce more offspring. That's, that's very, that's a tricky way to say it. It's, it's to replicate itself. It's to replicate itself, but, uh, it is not to just produce more of itself. Um, it, it, it is very possible that a, a species may want to produce less of itself. Um, but it does want to replicate itself. But to produce more offspring, it, and these, these, Jason, these, wouldn't that be replicating you, itself? You know, these things the same as reproducing itself. <laughs> Isn't that don't humans replicate themselves through reproduction? Yeah, I mean that's what I, you know. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, it was the way it was like, the way that you it was the way that you said it. Like, um, um, okay. it ev- isn't a process where it's like uh, it it, it like spreads and it just wants to keep spreading. Um, if you look at herpetology, if you take a snake, it's not as if uh, they'll keep growing until they bust out of the snake. There's species that will uh, grow within their environment. Right. Um, there are species that stop producing um, uh, offspring if the environment is not good or uh, good enough. Um, uh-huh. And they go extinct, you right? know. Yes. Yes, exactly. But, I, but right. But my point was that natural selection favors those who can reproduce more. That's the whole point of natural selection. The ones who cannot produce in their environment are the ones who go extinct over time. Yeah. Right. So uh, the reason I bring that up is I'm saying if religious belief is more adv- advantageous in that sense, then religious belief would be more likely to be preserved <laughs> by in, evolution. In, in, in... Okay. So how, how does religion make you live longer? Who, where did this come it, from? Well, it, there are studies that talk about meditation, but it's not living longer. It's producing naturalism. I'm oh, sorry, not natural. Natural selection does not care how long you live as long as you can reproduce. I mean, look at like a fruit fly or something, right? They have very short lifespans, but they produce like crazy thing with bacteria. So, and this is actually what I brought up in the moral argument earlier is that quality of life is not as important. It's quantity of life in that particular sense. Because again, natural selection has no issue with bacteria or flies when they don't live long. As long as you can live long enough. Hold, hold on. What do you what do you mean? Quality, uh, quantity? What? Say that again. I was saying that when when you look at natural selections, what qualities it is favoring, right? So, do you have two yeah, species? that's half of evolution. Natural selection. There, right. there's two. There are two halves to evolution. Yes. Natural selection is one half. And then and, random genetic okay, mutations. Okay, go go. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> right. You have random genetic mutation, right? And then natural selection. The mutations oh, can oh, be okay. Okay. Mutations can be beneficial, harmful, or neutral. And when I say beneficial, harmful, or neutral, I mean how it, beneficial to reproduction in an organism's particular environment. So if, sorry, go ahead. Or the X Men. <laughs> right, right. X Men, yeah, in that, in that particular sense, it could be. Um, if it, I don't if know it, why it, I said that. <laughs> that was good. I, w- I wish we would. But yeah, so. It would be pretty cool. The, the point I was trying to. It would be pretty cool. Jason, it would be pretty be cool. Gambit. But. <laughs> that would be cool yeah it's true with the cards it makes sense um so yeah so i guess and i didn't have time to lay these two premises out but is that if we can agree that evolution would preserve religious belief and i gave reasons why i think that would be true either it's preserving it because it is an accurate description of reality or it's preserving it just as a useful fiction for survival the first one's true we have no problem with theism if the second one could be true but if the second one's true that raises the problem of Evolution gives us beliefs that may not be reliable, and it will hold on to those. If that's the case, then that raises the question of which beliefs can we trust at all if evolution won't correct itself on our false beliefs. So I think that's self-defeating, and so I think option one would be better. So I think that we evolve these beliefs, but we evolve it because they're true and because it's an accurate description of reality. Just like we evolved belief uh, in light because it, there really are light waves that we pick up. Evolution doesn't correct false beliefs or anything like that um but how does evolution preserve religion well i mean i don't think if evolution didn't do you think that we know more now do we have more true beliefs now than our ancestors did thousands of years ago 
I would say so, yeah. I, okay, so yeah. that would be an example, I think, of correcting false belief. Like, you, you even brought up the example of the Earth, of the Earth revolving around the sun. I'm sorry, the but, sun, the Earth yeah. in the center of the universe or something, right? Oh, go ahead. And that, that was a false belief yeah, we but, used to have, and we know that's wrong now. You even said that we're supposed to discover a science and stuff like that, and that we're made to learn, and I agree with that, which is that would be correcting false beliefs that we previously had. That's, that's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Not, not, no, no, no. I don't think we're, we're we're made to discover science or anything. Um, we're uh -huh. made to learn. Um, we're made to interact with our surroundings. But when the, when you get specific like that, that's when that 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 distinct that distinction is, is very important. Um, because it was it's very possible that um we we didn't come out this way. Uh, we could have come out a different way. Um, in which we never learned science. Mm -hmm. um, that so so that distinction is very important. Um, the only thing that you can't take away is that we interact with our environment in some way. <laughs> right. Do you that's, think we would have survived? Do you think we would have survived as long if we didn't develop science at all? Because I mean, the industrial revolution was like a huge population boom. I think that as far as I don't, I don't, I don't, because I don't, I mean, are, did we survive long? I mean, I mean, what, what if we're the, what if we are the youngest um, uh, civilization in the entire universe so far? What if we're the oldest? Yeah. Um, I don't know if we're surviving long or short. There's only one human race that with that we've seen. Right. Well, we did, I mean, we did outlive like the Neanderthals and the Australopithic and all the different hominids you want to get into. Humans have been around for 200,000 years, if I get that right. And I mean, that's not there long compared to the dinosaur. So you have that on there. You had uh, uh, Homo, Homo erectus. Yes, uh, Homo you erectus. had Anthropithecus. Uh, Australopithecus. Or, yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, that was Lucy. There was like, there's like six. I think I tried memorizing them one time. Know, I got up to six. I actually know a couple of Neanderthals, dude. So. <laughs> Yeah, you can go to California and make that chart I pretty work with easily. A guy that's, that's just like people on the street. Huge. <laughs> He's a Neanderthal. Yeah. And I don't know. Why, I don't he know. knows. I don't he know knows how I, old. I make fun of him all the time. <laughs> that's fine. I don't know. I don't know how old either of you guys are, but there was a Neanderthal show on a while ago, and uh, it was really weird. And the characters were just popular from a commercial, and they made this show around them. Cool. It was fun. How are we on time, David? Got about five minutes left. All right. So do we want to move on to the moral argument real fast? We just haven't talked about that hardly at all. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, morality. Okay. okay. So I, I don't know if you, how much you took of what the premises I gave. I gave four reasons why I think that naturalism isn't sufficient, and then I gave positive reasons why I think theism is sufficient. So for when you see, what, 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 define naturalism for me. The belief that there are no supernatural beings and that nature is all that exists. Okay, um, so we, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to understand that because um, it sounds like I maybe I can't tell the difference between um, the position that no supernatural entities exist uh -huh. and not accepting that they do. Those are two different things. Sure. Well, I, when I was describing, I, I was saying if we presuppose, not presuppose, if we just assume for the sake of argument that there was no God, how would morality look? Or sorry, if there was no supernatural, we, we, how we would don't. morality look? Right. We don't assume. Yeah. Okay. But there are, but there are positive naturalistic. I'm not, I wasn't trying to define your view because I don't know your view on that, but that was modeled more for people like Sam Harris, who says not, who says that science and naturalism can't explain morality, can explain morality. That's what I was referring to. I didn't, I'm not saying you believe that, but I was just yeah. So I, I I would say I would say well I I would say I can't speak for Sam Harris. I can only right, speak right. For, for myself. But I would say that science can explain morality. Okay. Yeah. That's that's all I was at. That's all I was trying right. to bring up. Yeah. So yeah. So the reason I, the reasons I give, and I'll just focus on one of them. I, I agree that science can explain. Well, I agree that we can explain why we develop morality right i think we can say that was just evolutionary survival if we if we went around killing each other we wouldn't survive as a species very long so obviously you have to have rules but i think i want to make a difference between epistemology and ontology right epistemology is why do we know something to be true ontology is being sure. of what it is so i was talking more about moral mm -hmm. ontology of what is goodness what is value right and so it it seems to me like we can agree that it's wrong to do certain things because it, 
would you agree that humans have inherent value that we should respect? Uh, boy, that, that's that's a tricky one. So okay, so morality is is what we call um, it, morality is 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 is. I would say that the morality is um, a a. I have a really specific way that I like to phrase this definition, which is um, it's a label that we use to for things that we find socially acceptable and or mm -hmm. unacceptable with respect to a goal. Um, that, right. that would be my uh, definition of morality. Um, all morality is subjective unless demonstrated otherwise. However, our foundation of morality has the potential to be objective. And by that, I mean my, my foundation of morality is the well-being of myself and others. Mm -hmm. I determine that to be objective because that which is bad for your well-being is objective and not subjective. Yes. So it, it is true that we can objectively show that like stabbing a person will harm them, right? So in that sense, it is true that it's objective. Of We can demonstrate. Um, well, um, now, this might seem like a stupid interjection, but no, it, it's not objective that stabbing a person is objectively harmful. What if you have to perform a trig? Well, okay. Let's. Would you agree torturing a child for fun and no other reason is objectively harmful? Tugging them dad strings, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm the only one here. To <laughs> um, um, no, it, it's 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 important to phrase it this way, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, but um, I mean, kind of, because it, it it doesn't. I don't think it really matters if it's a child or a 96 year old. I don't think torture is a good, good thing. Um, okay. uh, you know, and no, I I don't think it's good to torture a child, and I. I wouldn't want to torture a child. But if um, someone else but, uh, did, you would still have issue with that, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Right, so you you wouldn't say that morality is as subjective as, like, your favorite color, right? If someone said, I like purple, and you said, I like red, I wouldn't care too much. But if someone said, oh, yeah, I don't mind molesting people, and you was like, that's horrible. Like, you wouldn't – certain opinions are just wrong, saying right? Saying that there's a – no, I would never – an opinion can't be right or wrong. And an opinion is a subjective position – that has no truth value. It, there's no truth value outside of the individual that holds it. It's that's as far as it goes. Um, an objective statement is the opposite of an opinion. Uh huh. Um, so do you think so, all uh, moral uh, statements are opinions, or are they objective statements? Or sorry, are all moral statements subjective opinions, or are they do they have objective statements or objective attributes? Um, what is it? I I don't think it. I, I don't think I don't think it's like that. I think some moral statements could be objective, and some moral statements may not be objective. Okay. Um, now, this is uh, I, I just want to make sure that I stay in the realm because because crossing the line between whether you're talking about the foundation of morality itself is is very important. I was trying so, to cover um, the I foundation. Just, yeah, that's okay, what I was trying to get at. Okay. Yeah. 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 How are we on time, David? One minute. Actually, right. yeah, two, uh, I'll tell you a two-minute warning. I'll give him another minute since y'all are just starting this. Okay. Yeah, so quick uh, – I'll try to wrap it up. And so quickly about foundation, right? That's why I was bringing up the idea of value, right? We would agree that – human. Or I hope you would agree that humans have it – it seems objectively true to us that humans have more value than a rock or an inanimate object. That if you, it, you, know, if you cut down a tree with an axe versus cutting up a human with an axe, we would obviously find more problems with the latter than the former right uh, uh well those are two different things um, they are believe it or not uh uh and so um uh so re repeat the first part you said with with um the with tree, uh yeah. you know some something objectively when when you're applying objective uh, just a few seconds ago i might have i think i forgot what the sentence was but are you saying are all moral statements subjective opinions and or objective or was it after that when so when we're okay so when we're saying that um something is objectively good mm -hmm. it, it's it's is so it's really easy to confuse these two things so it's really hard to to split it up because you you could be like no it's not objectively bad to kill someone it's not objectively bad to kill your kids um and then someone would be like are you saying it's okay to kill your kid no no i'm saying 
my children have value to me yes. and really nothing else. Um, they could have value to other parents like other parents' children will have value to me. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that is kind of as far as it goes. Um, but it, it, it's possible that that didn't have to be that way. Um, it, it's possible it didn't have to be that way. Um, there are other species that don't act that way. Yeah. Well, I agree that we're different than other species. I, I think we're inherently more valuable in that sense. But I, I would also like to ask, so, because it sounds like you're saying it is somewhat of a personal, like you feel very strongly that your children have value, and I would agree with you. But if someone, if someone wanted to harm your kids and they said, I don't care, I don't think your children have value, should that should you respect their opinion? Or I mean, we see that if if a if a racist that, person that happens said, all the time, it that does. happens a lot. And do you think that's wrong that it happens? Or are you against that? Well, of course I am. Right, but even, so you don't just see them as having a different opinion. You think do you think that they are wrong, or do you just think that they just don't have the same opinion as you? I mean, I I I I don't think so. Obviously, I are wrong is as mm -hmm. far as my ethics are concerned. Um, they're wrong as far as what I consider moral uh, behavior to be. Um, right. um, they're wrong in all those senses, but in no sense outside of that. So why should they care of what of your sense then? If guys do, and for the same reason everyone else does. Um, right. But and outside of the fact that most pe that there are people that don't we should care because i don't want to live in a society that uh -huh. doesn't care either um this we are we 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 are descendants from species you mm -hmm. can imagine a species um getting along and if they if they have a nature that ends up killing themselves out they're not going to make it um right. if they can work together if they can work together, then um, I got to plug my computer in, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna give me one second. Okay. I gotta push this little red. I don't know how button. much time we have Good. left, but You're I'll good. give you a second. I sure. Okay. This show's flexible. Okay. If I have the Infinity Gauntlet. <laughs> oh, nice. I know he's a Mar I know he's a comic book fan, but. David Palman, if you're going to watch this at any point. Palman just disappeared, you know. Frozen a second. Yeah, just, it oh. just froze out. There he is. Yeah, it just froze out. There we go. Oh, there we go. It happens sometimes. Were you going to say something, Jason? I think I called David an ass for leaving, <laughs> but I didn't mean it. <laughs> no. Right. Um. So, yeah. So, so the reason why we make it to the next species is for, for that reason. These are, these are all easily explained. Right. So I, um, yeah, I, I, and I brought that up earlier. So I don't disagree that we have to have rules to survive. Right. I wanted to get more foundational sure. that survival better than non survival, other than just personal preference. Right. What, because I, I think you would agree that the universe does, doesn't care about our survival. 99% of species it's have ever better. lived have, it's, it's better or it's more preferable. It, not, neither. That is is a personal opinion and it's better you right. say it's better because you are a human right but that's just i say it's better because i am a human 
Huh? Right, but we don't we don't want to be committing bias towards our own species, though, right? I mean, I agree that it's better for humans to survive, but I, because I think humans have objective value. At the same time, if 99% of species have gone extinct, it is true that the universe doesn't care about humans, right? We care about ourselves, but that's just, I think, a motivism at that sure. point of, I want, I want to be valuable and I want to care, so I'm going to pretend that my life has value and meaning, right? Even if it well, objectively we don't, doesn't. We don't, we don't pretend it has value and meaning. Value is imbued. We, we give it value and meaning. I don't pretend my son has value and meaning to me. He has value and meaning to me. He's worth 21's interested. <laughs> um, he has meaning to me. Uh, <laughs> value and meaning to me um i imbued him with that value and meaning uh-huh. um and uh uh but he's more important oh, go ahead no you're so if i say god has meaning to me that doesn't that necessarily mean that, that like that statement has an objective truth value right it might be mean it to me but that doesn't qualify me in saying that belief in god is reasonable right if i said like the afterlife has is really appealing to me because i value my life i want to live forever but of course it doesn't something just because we want it to be the case, right? We should believe it because it is the case. And so I think you, when you have these you subjective... Wouldn't be, you, you wouldn't be able to believe something because you wanted to. Right. That's not even possible. Right. But, well, that's what I'm saying, though, is, is isn't your value that you're subscribing and that wanting to have a purpose, not a desire? Is that not a belief you want to have? That, that I have meaning and purpose? Yes. Yes and no. Um, I have uh, I have a a desire to eat because mm-hmm. I don't want to die. Any any right. desire and meaning and purpose mm-hmm. you can attribute um, have have naturalistic explanations. Right. Yeah. No. I wasn't. Are we? Do you want to start wrapping um, up? You got David, a couple or, more minutes, and I'm you... letting y'all go out because uh, you know we're almost okay. to the top of the hour. So I'm just gonna let y'all finish. Okay. Up. I'll I'll let you know when uh, everything when it's time to wrap it. Yeah, no. So I'm trying to find a way to say this without being repetitive because I know I understand what Jason's saying. He's saying that because we just naturally want to survive and we have to you know eat and stuff like that. And those are just natural ways to. And that's not really that. In order to ha- to survive, we do have to have certain preconditions. Of that is is survive. Survival objectively better than not survival, or is that just what we want to be the case? Because it when, is, when you say better, when you say better, what do you mean? What do you mean I, better? I mean, well, like more, you like it. I I wouldn't even say e- neither. I would say that it's more of a brute fact of reality that it is that we have value and that value should be preserved, which is why I'm appealing to the objective. Which is why I'm saying I'm I'm saying value. I'm saying that for morality to be objective, value needs to be as real and as objective as it, it needs to be independent of our own mind. It's something that we Why? recognize through our senses because then you get Why? into subjective. Right. Because you get into emotive, which is what we are discussing. Like, in- I, I mean, but, but that doesn't tell me why that, that's, that's a bad thing or why you can't, why that you can't do that. What, what, why you can't be a subjective moralist or why you can't be an emotivist. you you were talking about objective value that outside of our, our minds yes what, what do you mean by that yeah well it's i mean it's like how i was saying we can't know for sure if the external world exists right but we are warranted to believe it because it seems obvious to us well i'm saying in the same light i think it seems obvious to us that objective value exists in that in that same sense and that it's an objective attribute of reality and that i think that humans are and this is where you get to like the image of god and all that theology that humans have that's special that's, value. that's for you. That's that's the important part where where you really quickly say, and that's where you get into God. That's the important. That's the part you you have to expand. Yes. Um, I, how does it? How does it demonstrate God? Right. Presented earlier was that I, I I'm saying that if there is objective value independent of human minds, right? There would have to be a source for that value, and I gave the qualities of what that would be. Have the highest form of value value and other things don't have high form of value then the source of that value might be an objective person because okay yeah, yeah do yes. uh, what what would you use to demonstrate that something else has a higher form of value 
outside of individual subjective preference. Well, I would say, I would say that moral value is a properly basic belief. It's, it's not to, the idea of wanting to survive and wanting to be unharmed and wanting to no, respect moral, others. Morals and values are not the same thing. Well, all morality comes down to values. Values can be distributive of that, but if value did not exist, morality would be meaningless. If certain things did not have better value than others, then humans would be no better than any other piece of atoms, right? Well, we I, value when you say better, when you say better, I don't know what you mean by better. What do you mean when you say better? More objectively valuable. Okay, so now when you say objectively valuable, objective mm -hmm. how? How Object is it objectively valuable? Objective is in it's independent of our how? How does that happen? Like if you right. so if you die, it's no longer valuable. If all humans die, mm -hmm. it's not so this computer I'm using has value to me. If right. it breaks, my wife will kill me. Mm -hmm. I, that is just probably <laughs> factual sure, um sure. and it has value to me if every human being on the planet dies it mm -hmm. no longer has value so i'm looking for a value that that characteristic what will still have value when we are gone because it exists outside because you have two types of concepts you have concrete mm -hmm. concepts which are concepts are for for everybody else i know you know what they mean <laughs> um right, concrete yeah concepts which is a concept of something that physically exists in reality and mm -hmm. we have um and, and we uh, we so we have concrete concepts and we have abstract concepts which are, are concepts that are but they still describe something you can physically interact with and see so when we're talking about objective morality outside of our mind um how does it exist outside of our mind Right. Well, that's why I was appealing to a mind outside of our own mind that is not contingent, which is why I was bringing up God, a personal mind that is the source yeah, of the let's, value. Let's keep going down. Let's keep yeah. going down the rabbit hole. Let's, and you brought let's up, follow this. So, yeah. And you, hold on. You brought up the death and, and everyone dying. Nobody else would believe in some kind of afterlife, right? That there is – that our lives have meaning because – because there is an eternity and because our actions here make a difference in the afterlife, right? And I would and I would agree that I think if everyone, if ultimately everything will end in death and the universe will die in a heat death, nothing matters because every consequence, every memory is why. So it, it's almost nihilistic in that sense. But, but none of that, none of those are things that we can determine or those are all all ifs, ifs, ifs. Like those are all ifs. Um, the concept of an afterlife is slightly nonsensical um i i can imagine a life after life um but i can't imagine a life after death death by definition is the process of not existing anymore um right. and uh so most theists believe in an afterlife but there's no reason to believe no sufficient evidence for it um, so what you're saying is is you're 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 pointing what you out things that it exist that uh -huh. we see um right. certain things because i i would have to see your argument again um okay. like the 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 you want to bring it up um, let me see if i can bring yeah it up go ahead fast. Yeah, i don't know how much time go, we have but go i'll ahead, go ahead and try david's gonna argument brought up again um, um so um oh here was the stuff i said about natural matter here's probably what you were asking more, more about was this right god is yeah, the estimation um, of morality okay uh, so, 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 uh, a fo foundation for objective moral values um, mm -hmm. would be timeless. Um, how do you get timeless? Right. So, if value could change over time, then it would be somewhat arbitrary, right? It would be hard to, it would be contingent, right? So, the reason that before we existed, if there was no God, there would be no objective value. It would just be neutrality, right? Oh, so, if value could change over time. Yes, if value, if value is contingent on cer certain circumstances that are themselves uh, that are conditional, that can ch change and evolve. Value over time. is contingent on a th and value is contingent contingent on a thinking mind. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, okay, but but thinking minds aren't timeless. Well, God's is. That's that's why I was trying but to get to that earlier. That's yeah, yeah. That's something you have to demonstrate. This right. doesn't demonstrate. No, but I was saying if we can agree objective value exists and that it would need 
and it's mind dependent and that we our minds have not always been here then to explain how that, that objective morality exists you would go to Can a I timeless just mind jump in here yeah real quick? Uh, yeah i, I don't i yeah because yeah. because we're, we're that's what i was trying to get, get here and i, and I want to ask this question okay you know when we posit god as a sure. hypothesis to explain everything uh, what i hear you saying jason a lot and and correct me if i'm wrong please i don't want to misrepresent uh but are you saying that we have to prove our hypothesis before we can give sufficient uh, time to review and to dem you, you know to investigate? Do we have to prove our hypothesis, demonstrate our hypothesis before the rest of the process is complete? Because yeah, that's, that you have to demonstrate. But that's not that's not how hypotheses work. I mean, you posit a hypothesis yeah, based off of yeah. Yeah, right? So Yes, it's a hypothesis until it becomes Yeah, so so if we're positing God as the hypothesis, I keep hearing you say that we have to demonstrate that God exists yeah, before we can posit a hypothesis, him as a hypothesis, and that's not how the science No, 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 no. Works. Okay. No, no. Okay. I never just, I never I just said wanted that. to make that clear. No, I All never right, said continue. that. Continue. <laughs> yeah, I I never said that. Yeah, yeah do... let's uh cuz we're we're wrapping up now. Let's uh do three yeah. minute closings. We did a plan for 5, but uh, uh, it's not going to be five for, for okay, me, so cool. it's fine. We love. Uh, yeah, Jason, they won't Jason be. you'll get the last word. Caleb, go first. All right. Yeah. So first of all, thanks for everyone for hosting this. Thank you, Jason. And this was really fun. I, I really enjoyed this. I think we got a lot of good points across and really understood each other better. So yeah, um, I think that I gave four reasons. Um, the so the first one we didn't logical argument. Um, that went to a little bit, but we didn't, I, as far as I see, we didn't really have enough discussion to refute or confirm that. Um, the second argument, probably we talked, we just disagreed on the deductive versus the hypothesis idea there. Uh, we talked a little bit about the miracles argument from the closer to the beginning of that section. And I think we got a lot of headway there. And then lastly, we talked about the property. I think that, um, that was a pretty good discussion. So overall, these are my four arguments. Um, um, how persuasive or unpersuasive they found them. And uh, yeah, I would just like to thank everyone for coming here. And I would always uh, like to be open-minded, and I'm sure it's the same way. And uh, I, I really hope he becomes a theist or Christian someday, but, you know, we have to wait and see. So thank you for everyone for coming on. All righty, over to me. You're good. Excellent. Okay, so... Yeah, I, I still haven't heard anything uh, convincing. You know, um, I, I think you can construct an argument around anything if you begin with um, there's a lot of arguments that, that are in the if column. And I still don't know how you demonstrate that something is timeless or something is outside of the mind or what, what, me what actual method that you use to determine any of these uh, conclusions that you have. Um, and uh, a lot of it rested on, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the studies that we can't really see or go into or determine or look at um, and, you know, opposing studies with equal amount of evidence. And um, yeah, a lot of a lot of what I saw were things that were built off of um, uh you know, presuppositions, things that I wouldn't call intuitive or anything of that nature. Um, this was probably one of the most fun things I've done in quite some time. Um, and I'm hoping uh, uh, we can do it again very, very soon. Um, I think it'll be more fun as it goes on. But um, yeah, yeah, so, that's so Jason, short. can we get a card trick there before too. you leave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have a little fun for the audience here. Here we go. I don't know uh, what I look like well, here. You're Maybe also I'll the uh, first to pull myself smoke up. While so I... broadcasting so on on our show. <laughs> it looks cool though. It, I don't have that style. I've got that. I've got that a few <laughs> times. I. Uh, oh yeah. There you go. go. All right, yeah. man. Ooh, looks like it hurts. Cool, cool. Good, there good, we good. go. Awesome. All right, guys. Thanks a lot cool, for man. having me. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, guys. Uh, we appreciate it, guys. Uh, uh, we got more to come. Um, Gary Habermas is in the work. Uh, Jay Warner Wallace confirmed on for February 1st. And we've got another debate coming up as well. So stay tuned. And thanks for joining us.